This meeting is being recorded. Hello, guys. Um, this is the lecture on vertebrate, uh, which is uh, going to be for the final exam. All right. So anyhow, one of the last lectures, of course, we have evolution after this. It's not the very, very last lecture. Maybe I should have done evolution first and then this one. But anyhow, um, Mother Teresa said people are unreasonable, illogical and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you good. If you do good, people accuse you of altered, uh, ul ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. So the next phylum that we need to talk about is phylum hemichordata. Sorry about that. Here we go. Phylum hemichordata. And then uh, Mother Teresa didn't say anything about these things, uh, but I'm sure she knew uh, something about them a little bit. I don't know. Uh, phylum hemichordata, they have dorsal nerve cord, they have gill slits and notochord. Remember, uh, the vertebrates, they have five characteristics, which you will come up. I will come up and I will mention it here in a minute, but hang on. They have five characteristics, the vertebrates. Hemi, it means almost. Right, Hemi, it means almost. Oh, come on. Uh, video. Stay with me. No, I don't know why. Okay, great. Hemi, it means almost and almost chordate animals. That's what these are. And out of the five characteristics, they only have three of them. Dorsal nerve cord, it means the nerve cord is uh, over here. In the previous, all of the animals we studied so far, except the starfish, uh, the echinoderms, the nerve, the nervous system of all of the annelids, uh, the uh, oh God, uh, insects, uh, the uh, arthropods, they were ladder-like. They were like a ladder. However, these animals, they have the nerve cord, which is on the dorsal, on the back of the animal. If this is the animal, in the back, they have the nerve cord, and the mouth is here, for example. So they have gill slits right here, and they have notochord. Notochord is a flexible rod. It can bend. Uh, in us right now, we human, well, when we were in other, our mother's womb, we did have notochord. But now it's our vertebrae. It can allows us to bend backward and forward. And that's called a notochord, which is a rod shape right here. So another name for this phylum is lesser durostomes. And of course, they are eosilomates. Uh, and an example of that, uh, which is acorn characteristics of the chordate and echinoderms, uh, that's what these are. This is the acorn worm. We, did we do have it in the lab. And the only thing I want you to know, the three body parts, which is the uh, proboscis, right here, trunk, all of this. And then you have the collar, which is right here. So three main parts. Do not worry about all of these uh, little other parts of the body, uh, which is not uh, that significant. Okay, then let's move. That's all I had to say about hemichordata. Okay, so let's move to chordata, the chordate animals. The five characteristics that I said, you and I had it. Uh, a frog, chicken, you name it. All of the animals that you're familiar with more than the invertebrate we study, they have these. They have a notochord. As I said, it's a flexible rod. When you and I were in our mother's womb, we did have a notochord, okay? We have a dorsal a tubular nerve cord, uh, pharyngeal, uh, Right, on the dorsal, that's same as hemichordata, or pharyngeal pouches or gill slits. Those three were in hemichordata. Hemichordata did not have endostyle or thyroid gland and also post anal tail. Okay, so and I sh here is a picture right here. So these are here is your notochord right here and dorsal nerve tube in the on top of notochord, pharyngeal gill slits right here, anus, post anal tail, and 
in this diagram, they didn't show you a, a thyroid or, or um, endostyle, which would be right around here, okay? So all five of them are in there. Those are the five characteristics. Here is a little bit of notochord. We studied this at the beginning of semester a little bit. Uh, here's an elastic sheet as a connective tissue and a fiber sheet. And then inside of the notochord, these are living cells, which they make up these um, uh, fiber material. And this is a picture of a lamprey. Uh, so it's, it's showing you the notochord is in a dorsal portion in the back of the animal. So, you know, all of the vertebrae, all of the um, deuterostrom animals, this is a diagram of all of the deuterostrom animals right here. So it's telling you that it came from a common ancestor. Possibly they had a common ancestor. So uh, a, a branching diagram showing the pattern of sharing evolutionary drive characteristics among species of, of uh, higher taxa. And that is the definition of a cladogram. This is a cladogram. A cladogram is just branching of species that shows they it came from a common ancestor right here. So species branch, and they all have different characteristics. Okay, so that is a, a cladogram. I don't know, my glasses are giving me a headache. Okay, another thing which is important in uh, study of evolution and study of vertebrae is the formation of the gills. So at the beginning, there was a mouth in a, some of this organism we studied, there was a mouth and there were cilia in here and then there was pharynx. And over a period of time, you know, the, the pharynx became powerful, muscular, and then they have, they formed the gills. And later on, the organisms evolve. That's my arrow. Look at my arrow. It means evolution. Organisms evolve, and they were, had capillary around pharynx and the gills. Okay, so that increased the amount of the oxygen the animals could take. So when they could take more oxygen by these capillaries, as a result, they ate more food and they could grow bigger and more advanced. And that's the idea of having capillaries eventually around the gills. Okay, so that is the evolution of the gills. Uh, started from just having animals with pharynx and then eventually muscular pharynx with gills and eventually that. So here is a subphylum, uh, uh, Eurocordata, right here, uh, tunicate animals, right here. And then uh, the larva of these organisms, we do have them in the lab. Uh, they are uh, mobile, they can move in the sea. But when they become adult, they become sessile. Okay. So adults are sessile right here. Adults have notochord and tail disappear, of course, after, but they went, when they were in larval stage, they had that, they had notochord, nerve ring. Uh, post anal tail and endostyle secretes mucus. So uh, these are this is the life cycle of the animal, and and then uh, I like to show you uh, they release uh, mucus. But one thing, common name is called sea squirts and tunicate uh, uh, tunic is a cellulose. Uh, this one is a mystery. A tunic is the outer layer of these animals made up of cellulose. Okay. And how animals make cellulose, we still do not know. Okay, cellulose, as you studied in bio one, it is something from plants. Okay, plants make cellulose, not animals. And that is a mystery. So again, a lot of structures in here, a lot of style, a lot of things, endostyle right here. Um, I'm not worried about it. Do not worry about it. Just know whatever I talked about. That you know these that slide you should know, and then the rest is not that significant. The next subphylum is subphylum uh, cephalocordata. Cephalo, as you know, means it means they have a head. And cephalocordata, their head is above uh, the mud sand. This is all mud. Okay, sand. 
and then uh, of course they are uh, they are uh, marine animals, and then they have these tentacles still, uh, right here, which they siphon and brings food to the mouth, and then of course they absorb. Uh, these are all gill slits. They absorb food and nutrient, and thyroid gland would be endostyle, would be right here. And they have a post anal tail. Here's the anus. Uh, I'm sorry, here's the anus, and here's the tail. Okay, so amphioxus, this is the name of sulfidum. We want amphioxus, amphioxus, it should be underlined right here. And that is the name of the organism. It has five characters of chordates. They have no heart, but they have closed circulatory system no gills and gas exchange across body wall. Remember, when I say no gills, but during the embryonic stages, they did have gill slits. Okay, so those are some of the things um, to take home. Subphylum vertebrata, uh, living endoskeleton, uh, as you know, our bone have, you studied at the beginning of semester, they have the osteocytes which are living. Pharynx and efficient respiration, closed circulatory system with capillaries, paired limbs, and advanced nervous system. Um, here is a hagfish uh, or lamprey. And well, this is a hagfish, they attaches the gills to the uh, body wall of fishes and they make it not out of themselves like this. And they suck blood this way, they can suck more blood. And uh, of course, they have this caudal fin. And um, that's all I have to say about this organism. So they do attach to the, uh, uh, to the gills or to the fishes and they suck them up. Uh, the other one is lamprey. Lamprey is the largest ectoparasite on planet Earth that we know of. And what happens, there are two terms I would like you to know is anadromous and catadromous. So anadromous animals, they are fishes, and pretty much both of them are fishes, that they migrate from the ocean uh, to the fresh water, to the lakes, rivers, streams, and then they spawn, they lay eggs. That's what spawning means. An example of that would be salmon that you eat in the store and lamprey, I don't think you would eat that. Okay. Catadromous animals, uh, fishes that migrate from fresh water, from lakes, from streams, uh, to ocean water, to marine and spot. An example of that would be eel. I know when you eat sushi, you eat eel. Okay, so those are catadromous animals. And the diagram here is showing you the life cycle of um, lamprey. Ichthyology, it means study of fishes. So, and fishes are, the term fishes is true if more than one species. You have a choice. You can use fishes. If you're referring to more than one species of fish, then you can use fishes. Uh, or you can use, say, fish. So the term fishes exist for those of you. If you don't want to use it for the rest of your life, you don't have to. Just use fish and still refer to different species of fish. So they are ectothermic. It means the external temperature determines the body temperature uh, to some extent. Of course, there is a homeostasis. And then uh, the jawless fish or hackfish lamprey, I showed you a picture of them. Jawed fish, bony and cartilaginous fishes and vertebral column replace the notochord. Of course, when in the embryonic stages, they have notochord, but when uh, are, are like us adults, they do not have notochord, they have vertebral column. Shark, you guys are very uh, fond of shark, some of you, so I thought I threw it in there and talk about it. But the main things is amp ampullary organ of Lorenzini. That is important, that is significant. Uh, it would be good to know because in the head region of the shark, you have a lot of them. They don't have a good eyesight, but they can detect water vibration, smell, and so on and so forth um, in their head, and they go toward, toward their prey. The details of it, how it works, let's not worry about it. Let's move on. But that is the structure I would like you to know 
the ampullary organ of Lorenz inside of them, they have neural mast cells and um, other structures as well. Uh, so, anyway. Fishes, they have the uh, fins. We have different names for uh, the fins. So I would like you to know that dorsal fin, you have the primary and secondary one first and second. And then you have the pectoral fin right here and pelvic fin. And then you have anal fin and caudal fin. There are three different types of caudal fin, which I will talk about it later. But the anal fin and pelvic fin or pectoral fin, these are the fins that develop to become arms and legs for the animals that they move from sea to the land. Okay, so that's why it is significant to know the anal fin and uh, caudal fin, uh, not, I'm sorry, anal fin and pelvic fin. And of course, the caudal fin became your coccyx, you know, if you're talking about human, um, it became coccyx. So as I said, there are three ichthyology study of fishes. There are three different type of um, caudal fin, uh, like shark right here. It's not equal size. So it's called the heterocircle. Uh, Diphycircle, it is just like that, like lamprey, lungfish, hagfish. They all have a diphycircle. And a homocircle, like the bass, it's equal. Both ends are equal with these homocircle like perch, bass, these type of fish. Then you have the fins. Um, uh, the ostracoderms and uh, placoderms are uh, the A for ancient fishes are used. So placoid, uh, we have the uh, placoid scales. You have ganoid scales, cycloid scales, and tenoid scales. You should know like placoid scales are cartilaginous fishes like, car like shark. Uh, Non-telost fishes, the uh, animals that are not a modern bony fish is called non-telost, like sunfish. And then we have telost fish, the modern bony fishes, they have cycloid and tenoid. C silent. Okay, so telos fishes would be like bass. Okay, it's a it's a perch. These are new. Um, these are the modern bone fish. Here's a cladogram of evolution of the fishes. How fishes were evolved and um, what happened to them, so on and so forth. In herpetology is study of amphibians and reptiles. The first thing we are going to discuss are the amphibians. So when animals move from sea, they were amphibians. They were part of the life was spent in the sea. Usually immature stages of life was in the sea and the mature stages of life was in the land. But the land that they had to stay near water. They couldn't get away from water or uh, they could not go to the desert. I hope I'm making some sense. So double life amphibians, ectothermic, again, the external temperature determines the temperature of the body. Um, again, within tolerable limits. Sources of the body heat, <coughs> heat uh, heart has three chambers, two atrio and one ventricle. And the spiral valve is a valve that separates the blood, the oxygenated blood from deoxygenated blood, uh, which you will see a, a picture of it. Some animals have poisoned skin, like frogs, some frogs, they have poisoned skin, and respiration by mouth, skin, and lung. So three method of respiration. Uh, brain has 10 cranial nerves. I don't know if you dissected frogs or not. I did when I was junior, sophomore in college. And they have 10 cranial nerves. They have 10 cranial nerves. So um, respiration by mouth and brain uh, with 10 cranial nerves. 
Here is the circulation of the blood in these animals and spiral uh, valve uh, right here. That would be the spiral valve. So it does not allow the, uh, the two blood get uh, mixed up. A uh, couple of terminologies here in the frogs or you know animals in general, the male clasps female right here and uh, amplexus is, is, is the name of the process, right? The clasping, just go and the amplexus. And of course, uh, the fertilization is external, uh, male re uh, release the sperm, female release the egg and sperm fertilizes the egg and in the water. Uh, you have eventually after. So herpetology again, reptiles, the first vertebrate on land, occipital condyle. We'll talk about that, the opening behind the eye, the eye orbit, the, the, there is an opening in here. We'll talk about what type of occipital condyle they have. That opening is called occipital condyle. Three chamber heart, except crocodilians have four chambers, cranial nerves, 12 of them from the brain and different amphibians outside temperature determines the sex of the animal. Here, that's what I was talking about. Your pectoral uh, fin eventually becomes a forearm and anal fin becomes legs when the animal starts moving to the land. Here's a cladogram of herpetology. Uh, okay, so this is this is important. So I would like you to know anapsid animals, animals that they do not have any opening in the back. An example of that would be turtle. Okay, then synapsid animals, which we are, we are human, that would be like a fox, mammals. And then you have diapsid animals right here. Diapsid skulls with two uh, temporal opening and that would be like um, uh, some birds and some uh, crocodiles. Okay, they have two in the skulls, they have two openings uh, in the back. Okay, ornithology uh, is study of uh, birds, avians, aves, and these animals are endothermic, internal uh, generation of heat. Archaeopteryx uh, lithographica is the uh, fossil records, the imprint they found in Germany. Uh, it was the first bird they found on stones. And they, they have sternum and keel, two different bones. It's in front of the animals. You will see a picture of it here now. Sternum is where uh, the, the ribs attach and keel is the, where their flight muscles attach uh, in, these, in, in the birds. They all have feather, but not, uh, they all can fly, of course, different type of feather. Here is the Archaeopteryx lithographica. Uh, they found it, and, and nowadays they say most of the dinosaurs were birds, uh, not uh, reptiles, but we can, we'll see what happens. There is a theory how these animals learn to fly. Uh, there are two theories. One, they went on top of a cliff and they jumped down. Of course, at the beginning, they didn't know how to fly, they died. The other theory is they were on the land and they learned how to fly going up. At the beginning, that was the most accepted theory to go from ground up. But now they are accepting, they are saying this theory that they were on top of the ground and they flew down, uh, they learned how to fly. And that was the first thing. They are, that's the most accepted theory right now. Different type of feather, we have them in the lab. Vein feather is the most common one. And then dawn, which you put it in your pillows. And uh, flip plume and bristol, these are all different type of feather. But the most common one is vein feather, which I will talk about it. Uh, right here is the quail, right here is the shaft, and right here you have barb, and attach the barb or barbules. Okay, so those are parts of the vein feather. 
Oh, right. <laughs> okay, coil, uh, shaft, I talked about it. You have vein and then, um, and then the, of course, uh, the barb right here and the barbules are attached to it. So the, uh, the birds, they learn how to fly. <clears throat> uh, there are a couple of factors, not only the feather, uh, they had the air sacs, it made them more buoyant, uh, plus the lungs. And also the bones, uh, these are different type of, uh, do not worry about this. Uh, when you take ornithology, you go outside and you watch birds, and then those are the things you look for. Uh, to be able to call the birds and also the sound of the bird. Uh, I had friends who took in, in undergraduate, they took ornithology. In the morning, they went out and the lab practical exam, they had to listen to the sound of the bird and write down the name of the bird. But anyhow. Um, so another, another thing that um, birds develop to be able to fly, the spongy bone was more. Look at all of the amount of spongy bone in here. There's only a little bit of compact bone, compact bone here, not in us. In us, our compact bone is thicker, it's more than our spongy bone, okay? Another thing I wanna show you is the keel. You guys see that? That's the keel where the, um, the flight muscles attached, okay? And then of course you have sternum right here. We talked about that. Here are the uh, comparing, do not worry about all of the details, comparing ancient birds with modern birds, uh, skeleton, that's what that is. Here is the ornithology of the birds, how birds evolved and so on and so forth. The next one and the last one are the mammals, mammalogy, two mammals lay eggs, uh, marsupial mammals, they have a pouch and the young goes in the pouch the marsupial we have in northern uh, North America is opossum. Of course, you know, Australia is very famous, wallabies and kangaroos. Functions of the hair protection, insulation, and behavior. Of course, we talked about behavior at the beginning of semester. So the animals make their hair erect. So it shows the opponent I'm big. Uh, that's what I mean by behavior. Homeothermic, may, uh, maintain same body temperature. Uh, difference between anapsic diapsid and synapsid. I'll talk about that. Here are the two animals that they are, they lay eggs, uh, duck-billed platypus and spiny and eater. Okay, they are mammals. They have mammary glands. The young will uh, drink milk from these animals, from the mother, but uh, they lay eggs. Okay, but still they're mammals. Uh, digestive system, all have teeth except some uh, whales and anteaters, insectivores, herbivores, carnivores, omnivores. Omnivores means they eat everything. We humans are supposed to be omnivores. What is cecum and its function? Uh, it stores food and that's what is function, right? Here you can see uh, in insectivores, uh, you have a short intestine and no cecum. In uh, ruminant animals, I would like you to know different stomach, there's esophagus, and this uh, stomach has four chambers, rumen, reticulum, omasum, and abomasum. So those are the four, like cow, sheep, uh, deer, of course, they have uh, for regurgitation, they bring it back up and chew it and eat it eventually. They have huge cecum. Look at the cecum, okay. And then non-ruminant animals uh, like us, uh, the uh, herbivores, not herbivores, not us, omnivores, herbivores, they have a cecum, which is a good size. And then of course the carnivores, cecum is very reduced. We human has a very small cecum, like carnivores, but we are not carnivores, we are um, omnivores. So what happens called cyclical population, the population changes and then if you have birds, a lot of birds show up and then the predators are low. So that there's a lot of food. So the number of predators go up. And then what happens over a period of time, we're talking about years, 
you know, over a period of time, and uh, then it seems that there are lots of predators, the number of the prey, the birds go down. And then next cycle, if there's not enough food, the number of predators go down. And then the next cycle, then there's not a lot of predators, so the prey population increase, and so on and so forth. It's called cyclical population, and I hope. Um, I said that in a few meetings, uh, we are not using it, we are abusing it, that's Mother Earth. You've heard a lot of saying from different uh, authors, different things throughout the semester, but um, that is from me. We are not using it, we are abusing it. Mother Teresa continues to say, honesty and frankness makes you vulnerable. Be honest and frank. People favor underdogs, but follow only top dogs. Fight for underdogs anyway. We spent uh, years building, uh, maybe destroyed overnight, built anyway. People really need help, but may attack you if you help them. Help people anyway. Give the world the best you have and you will get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. Okay, you guys, these are some of the pictures. I'm gonna let you uh, look at them and enjoy on your own. Uh, by uh, what is developing in the world of genetics, these are possible. These are, of course, uh, it's gonna be very meticulous, very tiny, uh, they can do them. Uh, you know, the CRISPR gene, you've heard of that. Um, First, let's take care of our diseases. But definitely, this is Photoshop. They did not do a good one on this one. The rest of them pretty good, looks pretty good, but not that one. <clears throat> but anyhow, and that's the end of it. These things, I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about that. All right, 